appreciate you taking the time to do this. I, I know the pandemic's kind of made people a little stir crazy lately. Hopefully everything's good with you, your friends, your family. Yeah, it's all good. Um, if anything, you know, I hate to sound positive about it because, you know, people are, people are dying. Um, but it's been, it's, it's been amazing in many ways. As a, for a creative, um, you know, we don't really get much <laughs> support or uh, good, good feeling from the world. So being able to have time to not worry about the, the gen, you know, the average day-to-day -day annoyances of like trying to fit into society just you can actually just create it's like a free pass to just create so for me it's just been work on a tv show finish one style of album finish another style of album and just keep working so it's it's actually been a bit of a blessing but have things kind of been like a, a whirlwind considering like i mean the video with vice appearing on facebook kind of gave kind of a, a resurgence if you will i mean yeah yeah it's a it's a weird one because it's it, every couple of years the story goes through a, another like boom because it'll like the the documentary still makes its way around the world so it'll hit you know middle east and then there's a it's like the first time the story breaks you know so that when it hit australia it was like a couple of years after it released here and then it was huge there and so the same kind of thing happens like doing the same press runs <laughs> but uh i think it's a it's maybe a little bit different with with um vice and social media because of how fast i mean it got something like four million views in three hours or something you know and it's it's a pretty bizarre thing um i mean i went on bbc tv and it never had anywhere near the impact you know i mean if bbc breakfast which people are watching bbc breakfast for a rapper you know <laughs> like it's not really the, not really the target audience <laughs> you know but um yeah no this has been pretty interesting i've been working on the tv series and we we've, we've already been really i've had a couple of film deals but um working on the tv series and uh we already had good things happening we we're already like quite quite far down the line of a um a life rights deal to make it a potential video game um a theater production and a TV series, and even potentially do like a an American spinoff. Um, so there was all that happening already, but the interest in all that's kind of just went through the roof. So I started getting cold calls from Beverly Hills, uh, LA, um, and I guess the good thing for me is that it kind of helps up deals. <laughs> you know, it kind of like you can create kind of a bit of a, a kind of signing frenzy. But um, yeah, it's a it's it's an interesting time. Is it bittersweet at all? I mean, this is really kind of the documentary dropped. What was it? Almost seven years ago. The doc did, yeah. I mean, I wrote the book in two thousand nine, and the book did really well. It's I, it's a weird it's a weird. You could look at it like, you know, like success for me is it should never be instantaneous because if it's instantaneous, it probably something weird happened you know like you don't want to be famous for a for a viral video because what else have you done then you know now the pressure to consistently make a viral out of everything is bad because who wants that pressure whereas for me it's a an interesting way i, I get this kind of thing asked a lot like um, any regrets and i always say well no because the journey i've been on is now one of the most unique in hip-hop history it's it's quite a interesting thing you know um if i just if you just get in, release a record, your career is over in two to three years. From the moment you hit that point where you're boom, you're in, it's downhill. There's never an uphill trajectory. You're only uphill if, if, you're, if you play the game so well. Maybe Eminem, um, but the amount of lack of control he's had compared to now having control. Like you have to play serious games if you want to stay in, you know? So for me, it's like uh, most, of the, most of my favorite rappers that I've ever been into, Half of them are broke, don't have any money. Um, you know, there's not really any money in music. So to be able to have a story that goes across different mediums, that touches multiple different uh, types of fan bases, that's been, for me, has been a real blessing. When I started out, I never started out, most of the time I was like trying to parody things and trying to expose the kind of, you know, 
the holes and and kind of you know insane ways of thinking even though i was in, i was insane <laughs> but uh i always just wanted to start like a conversation i wanted to be able to push things and you know get people talking and for me to be able to do that about my own career not by trying but accidentally and just the whole time getting better at what you do i'm still learning i still i still love music i, I still sit down every time and think i'm shit i think i'm how did i make the last track i'm so useless and i think if i ever thought about success or like oh i just i was on stage with eminem or i produced for the beat or you know if i ever thought anything like that it would stop my potential growth as an artist. And I think once you're attached to that, you know, you, you can be a good artist, you know, any idea of, Oh, I'm great. Or I've got, I'm this, I'm that you're on the downward trajectory. As soon as you think like that, I think. Well, okay. well, with that said, I mean, considering kind of the narrative, the story's already been established in that documentary, but there's so many years that followed thereafter. Is, is there really like another chapter between you and Billy? Yeah, I mean, the, and the crazy thing is that the documentary only really covers two years of an initial seven year story. So they only picked two years to cover um, and then they kind of jumped over a whole bunch of stuff. And also they never told the truth about what really happened between us at the end of it. They kind of, they decided on their, um, their their ending of like this kind of artistic thing billy flies off in a helicopter mm -hmm. you know i'm still in london like i was doing tours with a punk rock band and sold out venues and they decided to kind of make it look like oh he's still a struggling artist in london he's gone backwards you know so it was their idea to kind of tell a bit of a false narrative at the end but the reality was there was still a lot of stuff between bill and i we got back together we made a record it was a roller coaster just making that happening we went on tour we ended up in <laughs> Uh, in the States touring with a band called The View from Scotland who are maniacs and there was a whole bunch of stuff that just kept happening there was uh, rights disputes there was you can't tell this story because I'll tell this and it, it's a pretty hectic story that's just constantly escalated all the way up to kind of where we're at now um, but yeah and I think the book tells a, a, a longer you know like a fuller story mm -hmm. but I think that's why I'm I decided to write a TV series now because it's really hard to get anything of, of quality across in even an hour, you know, even writing it as a screenplay, it's, you have, you can't tell, there's like seven people have died along the story and a part of the story, you know, like best friends, people that we loved. You can't tell of any of that. You can't build characters because you're just onto the next big funny thing that happened. And so you never actually get a, a, a a grip of the heartache of what we were actually going like why we ha feel that we have to be other people to even exist in this music sphere like the pain that, that is carrying and pushing us the fear uh you can't really really get that across in, in, a, in a short video you know so <laughs> i end up just getting hit with loads of questions after these things come out and then it's like well i have to get find a way of getting it all out in a long form tv series and then move away from it you know how often do you guys kind of find yourself playing the uh, the what if factor? I mean, considering that you guys reunited, you guys got back together, have you ever kind of moved past that point of like, I guess, really being able to move on or? Um, I think, I mean, because I've managed to get, I think that would be a big issue and it's a huge issue with musicians. It's almost like a, a kind of PSD, you know, like a, it's, it's something that can really hold you back. If you, if you're always trying to get like massively famous, like, oh, I want, like you might go and support the biggest band in the world and you won't actually even enjoy it because you think the next day, like, well, that should be huge. Like what else, you know, you never, you had this expectation pulling you all the, all the way. Whereas when, when, what we set out to do, we had no hope. We had, we had been told that we're done. So every day after that, from the moment we decided let's do this, every day was just fun. Every day was like, God, if we, if we get if we get this if we even <clears throat> we even have a good show and have everyone liking our lyrics like that's a win you know so we were not in that kind of privileged like i i need to get this my manager has to get this for me it was it was more like every, whatever we get here is is gonna gonna be a win we thought we would go down to london that time when we decided to become syllable brains we thought we would go down we had 90 pounds between us we thought we'll be back home in two weeks there's no way this could work you know like but then when you're running on that adrenaline 
and you, you, we, we used to have this thing where we'd, we'd say like, um, we'd say there's a gun at your head and if you don't do the thing you want to do right now, um, or it's the guns at your mom's head, that someone's going to pull that trigger. So think about your mom dying right now if you don't just go and make this happen. So that was our kind of mentality that we would just make things happen. And it was hard to live like that, you know, but in the same way, we never, you know, we never got to worry too much about certain things, but we also just kept going and just like, ah, this is amazing. But as soon as we got to the point of being on stage with Eminem or, and touring with them, that was just like, we could never have even foreseen that. So that was great. And then I think it is a common, um, it's a common idea like, oh yeah, but, but you were so good. Like what, what could have happened? And for me, it's like, yeah, but if we released, I knew that the reality of things, like if we released, we could get sued. We've been told that by the lawyer who found out. Um, so, and at that point it was like about a million something. So that money would have been, we would have been in jail then for fraud. And, um, also, we would have lost all the music that we'd made. We made six albums in two years on, under Sony. We would have lost all that music. Um, so I was just kind of at that point trying to figure out a way of like, how do, I, how do we solve this? How do, we, how do we actually just make this happen? You know, like it wasn't just let's get in, be like, do this and then get out. No, it was like, let me figure a way of actually how we can release and it be okay. So that's why we became a punk rock band midway through, <laughs> which Sony didn't have any idea why we were doing that. But for me, it was like, if you're a punk rock band, no one cares about where you're from, what hood you rep or anything like that. If you're good, you're just good. And then we could have slowly edged the uh, accents out. And I even thought we can just say, well, we're from Scotland. And that would have been cool for punk rock. You know, we could have, see, said, we could have said to Sony, we're going to pretend that we're Scottish. And we could have seen how, <laughs> how that would have worked. But it never really got that far um, because there was like a, after the point where we achieved what we wanted to, and then we kind of kept not releasing the record because we would have got caught out if we did at that point between bill and i it was just like you know he never understood why there why we had to do why we had to make it work and i was like trying to make it work you know so the, the divide just started to pull us apart you know but i don't ever think about it like you know what would have happened because i've seen so many artists you know mm -hmm. I've, like if we released and the, and the story came out people would have just been like oh vanilla 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 scat uh, vanilla <laughs> milli vanilli uh, they would have just been like, oh, they never did anything. Well, they wouldn't have thought, they wouldn't have known that actually, no, we wrote everything, we produced everything, we controlled everything. But I, I think it was, uh, I was, it was a case of I managed to see from other artists that I knew, they'd get their single out, they'd have a bit of a buzz, um, they'd have a bit of a buzz and then nothing would happen. They'd be, they'd be, they'd be back working in, in, in the local department store uh, and they, they would have played all these big festivals and toured and they wouldn't have had anything you know so I think in retrospect maybe if I didn't get success off the back of the book if maybe because uh, for me I, I didn't just want to be a rapper I, I was a writer since I was a kid I was you know always I had this dream of being a best-selling author but I thought that would happen at, like when I'm 50 60 you know when I actually mm -hmm. knew something about the world um, but to do that by 30 and then actually I fell in love with making music and not sampling and producing and actually became a real artist after Silver Brains, you know, so I actually have enjoyed the journey since, you know, actually becoming a real producer, becoming a real artist, learning how to do everything and writing and working in different formats. But for me, I, I don't think that would have ever happened if I just got in, put a record out, you know, you would be the, oh, the funny guys is have that song about masturbation. Oh, you know, you just get you get wiped off to the side. And that's sometimes I don't think we understand that the worst thing for you could be success if you get it in the wrong way, you know? Yeah, I mean, like, kind of alluding, like, what you're saying. I mean, over the years, not, not even just in music and sports, it's almost like people kind of assume a role and you're pigeonholed in that role and it's kind of hard to break out of it. I mean, yeah. do you kind of see that? I mean, it, being really in that industry, seeing kind of, I guess you could call it the fakeness of people. Like there might be that artist that's hardcore punk rock, but they're so afraid of letting anybody know that they also listen to classical music. <laughs> that gets yeah. out there, you just ruined your own scene. Yeah, and I mean, when we were in doing the thing at Sony, like I couldn't believe how fake everyone else was. And 
we were being fake characters, but there was something a little bit real about that, like knowing that we're in this situation, dealing with the problem, you know, having it a thing between us, knowing that this is a game. Sure, we did lose our minds a bit when, you know, you start to like the success you're having, mm-hmm. but, but the amount of people that we would see that would just, you could tell, like, one minute they would dress this way, um, and they would be all about this style or this way of thinking. Next minute, boom, they changed because their style has said, well, this is actually better for your career. The amount of people that we met that were being put together in other relationships with other bands because it would make sense press-wise to sell that story. It was just, I was like, you learn these things. And you're like, wow, this is crazy. Like everyone is just doing whatever it takes to get their music somewhere. Never mind like, well, don't be in a relationship with someone because it's good for your music. Like fall in love. Nah, but I, I gotta get my music somewhere, you know. And it's it's a it's a bizarre thing. So we found that there was a lot more fake people out there than, and I think it's very it's it's quite it's become quite different now because music's so diverse. There's such a mm-hmm. wide array, you know. Like now, I think it's cool that people just mash up loads of different sound. I think the, the likes of people like Twenty One Pilots and just groups who have found a great a great idea in mashing up all the genres together. And I think that's that's allowed other people to be happy with, you know, liking <laughs> whatever they like, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, still to this day, this stuff happens, you know, you've got people like, um, uh, what's his face? 69 who, um, you know, he's a, he's most likely like a good kid and then turn it's just this kind of idea that you perpetuate. And then that idea that you perpetuate ends up get you, gets you thrown in jail. Mm-hmm. And, You know what I mean? It's kind of like you kind of have to be careful what you're pretending to be, you know, Um, because I think it can catch up with you. And I I think the good thing with us is that we were pretending to be a couple of assholes. And if anything, we were kind of exposing, you know, the kind of dishbaggery of of (laughs) of that, you know, and having fun just being assholes, you know. But it's no no one's getting hurt. No one's you know, it's it's not a bad thing, you know. But but don't you just see from that perspective, I mean, really, like, it's almost like the music industry necessitates you to take on these face values. You guys don't necessarily uh, make that character. It's something that, like, you have to be a part of. Otherwise, as, like, you, they said it in the documentary, you guys are the Scottish proclaimers. I mean, what's that about? Yeah, I mean, it's, if you love your art and you work hard at it, you don't necessarily think about branding. You don't think about yourself as a business. And nowadays that's permanent. That's what you have to think like. And we were, we just kind of came across that very quickly. You know, it was like, you're never going to make it because you're Scottish and people think of, you know, groundskeeper Willie from Simpsons. They think of like Billy Connolly. They don't think of rap, which is the most unbelievably crazy thing that you think that another human can't just put words together. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean, it's like, but as in what they're saying really is as a business, we cannot sell your business, you know? So then you start thinking about like, like it's a business. And so kids come up now, they understand that actually the, the, you don't have to be that good. You just have to make sure that you're the marketing of you, the branding, the imagery, every four weeks, I've got to do something crazy. That's got to hit the news. I've, I've got to be about that life. And that's the dangerous thing. And while you've got labels and, you know, I was just telling a friend about the A&R Monday, A&R meetings every Monday at most labels around the world. When they sit down, the, 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 the artists that are being put in front of them, they're all good. No one's, good, good, being good goes without saying. But what they're looking at is, is this sexy? Okay, then we're going to exploit the sex side of it. Is this empathet- empathetic? Is there sympathy there? Okay, well, Ed Sheeran, fat ginger kid, sings take away the fat ginger kid pale skin you don't really have an artist there he's great but you don't have a sellable artist there and then subo or or, uh you know adele being fat you know like all these that's how the industry looks at it they'll never just hear a great singer and the potential of that it's like how do we sell this oh they're fat they're overweight ah we can sell that oh they're ugly ginger ah we can sell that and that's the horrifying nature of an industry again it's not a it's not the people in it per se. They're just perpetuating the, the, the bad parts of their job. It's the systemic problem of an industry of like, how do we sell artists? You know, yeah. really, really having that gimmick. Yeah. How do we create a gimmick around an artist? And if they don't like it, well, they can get lost. <laughs> There's another sucker who's going to come in their place. 
you, you, you mentioned that uh, you, TV series, possible uh, movie. It, is that kind of a, along the lines of like a biopic? Could, could be kind of, I don't know, are we about to witness the next biopic kind of like Elton John, Springsteen, NWA, all those that kind of launch the, those movies? Or is that like a far off goal? Or I think for me, the only thing I think about is how do I tell the story uh, and do it complete complete justice because uh and just in writing like it's a it'll be probably a 12 episode series and in just writing a one hour episode um you actually can do a lot you've got time to build the friendships you've got time to build the, the, the kind of context but then there's just so much things that happen there's big moments in every episode so um for me it's just a case of i just want to tell pe people look at the vice thing and they'll watch the documentary but and even reading the book, they still don't actually know just how crazy this story is. The actual things that have happened in the story, I think are very shocking. What it says about the industry, uh, the things that will come out will be very, very shocking, you know? And I just want to be able to tell that that way. I, had a, I almost had a chance to tell an American version of it. I wrote a show called uh, LA Underground, which was going to be, you know, what if this story happened in America? And there was a lot of interest. Um, Warner Brother Records wanted to make it. And then when they realized that it was basically showing how the music industry is, they didn't want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. they, didn't have a they didn't have a sense of humor about just how dark some things are in the music industry, you know? So, um, so yeah, so I just want to be able to tell it how it is. And I think having, the, you know, good press come out, having like things like Device and then having new fan bases being born all the time. A few years ago, we were told by one major production company that, oh, well, the story's old now. And then it comes out again, and then all the all the young kids are back into the story. And the story's now become, in hip-hop, a bit of folklore. You know, it's it's become like this, mm -hmm. this crazy thing, you know? <laughs> it's like this story that happened that, you know, I think would be a shame if it didn't get told properly, you know? Um, so there's there's a chance of that. There's a chance of doing like a podcast and like in a docu series that actually picks up and brings you up to speed, you know, while telling the story going backwards. So there's just a lot of good opportunities that have come, and I think I'm happy that they've come because it's been a pretty hard slog, you know, <laughs> like having to just stay in the zone. No, I'm just going to keep making good records. I'm just going to keep believing in what I do and loving what I do, and you can't control the rest of it. I see a lot of young artists out there trying to do this, trying to do that. I've got to get into this playlist. I got, I got to do this. I got to be this person. And I think just make music and love it and do it for enough time that eventually good things just happen. You know, like if you just ducked out, if I ducked out and the stories were talk, talking about me in the past and what do I do now? Oh, I, I work at a bar or, you know, it would be horrifying. I think it would be horrifying for young fans who want to actually take that step, you know, into music, you know, cause I'm here saying, take the step into music, but don't be about the money and the fame, be about the music and good things will happen, you know? So with, with what you're doing, I, I mean, I'm guessing, even though obviously you guys probably have one of the best acting uh, resumes that there is with <laughs> what, what unfolded, but I got to imagine at this point, there's somebody else going to play you guys, right? Yeah, and I think that's fun. I think that's a really good thing. Um, the worst thing ever, it, it's hard to write yourself. To even write your own voice is hard. To play yourself, uh, that is just something I couldn't imagine anyone doing well. You know? so, so if anybody could play you guys, who would it be? Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of good actors, good young actors out there. Um, but I think, so there's the, the actor from... Um, Robert, his name, uh, he was in The Bodyguard and he was in Lord of the Rings. Uh, not Elijah John. Wood? Elijah Snows, Elijah, Elijah Wood is actually pretty, pretty good. There was a funny thing that happened when we were in a film deal the first time. Um, I went into a, a meeting and we were talking about who, who could play me. And I suggest, uh, suggested Daniel Radcliffe because I actually knew that he was a good rapper. He actually likes all the oh, yeah, yeah. He likes the exact same rap as me. So I thought this would be great. And also people would be surprised at how good he is at getting it. Um, and then it, that almost got close to happening, but he had another project on where he was playing a rapper. So, um, so yeah, so there is, so there's people like that out there, but um, 
it's most likely going to be like a young a young actor maybe and it's probably going to be the budget will be going on like a, a really big director and getting the actual visual side of it really good um the music is going to take up a lot of the budget because there's going to have to be eminem and a, and a whole different uh getting eminem in it's probably going to have to be pretty <laughs> difficult if we can get that happening but there is so yeah i think they're most likely going to be like finding really good actors who are skillful and can actually rap teaching them how to rap could be quite fun you know so uh yeah it's a very fun project you know it's exciting did, did you ever like after all this did you ever really establish that relationship with uh eminem and d12 no we never got to like follow on from that tour because also one thing was like we were scared that if they found out the truth we'd be you know it wouldn't be cool um and and so there's people now who are kind of like links between us who are kind of starting to do the kind of in between but um because i don't know how we go forward telling the story without m's involvement or without um the use of his music and stuff so um yeah so it's uh we just we just never got to to build and it's just, that's one of the saddest things as well is that that's probably one of the things we would have wanted more than anything was to actually get a full appreciation of each other rather than just sharing the stage together and being on tour, which was good enough for us, really. If, if nothing else happens from that, good enough for us, you know? <laughs> but to actually kind of like, uh, you know, the, our, our storylines are phenom are crazy. How M's storyline was going. <laughs> our story, it's like such different worlds, you know? It's like, it could be quite fun, fun to kind of like bounce off how those two journeys were. But um, I have no, no expectation on that at all, you know? What, what about you said you you finally got into the states and all you, you ever make it around to uh, what, what was it san jacinto yet in cali <laughs> not not yet because uh kind of want to do that like if we're shooting a podcast or a docuseries i kind of want to do that one day you know just turn up and actually see what it's uh really like compared to the stories that we used to tell about it <laughs> i have met people who have said like uh, you know i live just in the neighborhood next to that um it's nothing like what you said it was <laughs> <laughs> in the book, you know, because I described it as this kind of crazy place, you know, like a really nice suburb during the day and yeah. at night it's just kind of a heated of sex and violence. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you might have billboards over there and everything and not even know it. You, you put them on the map. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we really flew a uh, Hemet and uh, San Jacinto. We really flew that flag. We might be the, the biggest thing to come out of there. We've never been there. <laughs> 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 no disrespect to anyone who has come out of there so i mean considering everything like you, you've gone through you, you don't have like i, I mean yes there's got to be negativity with the music industry but obviously <laughs> positive means i mean i i recently got got to check out uh get your your tracks wrecking machine and empire falls i mean they're, yeah. they're absolute bangers i mean it's just like it's waiting to be heard so yeah. Do you take like solace and knowing that it's really good, but also take like take it with a bit of uh, salt in the fact that like why is this not out there? I know it's a good track. People are telling yeah. me they're good tracks, but why isn't this heard for the masses? No, I kind of like got rid of that feeling early on because I mean the, one of the first things that happened when we were at Syllable and Brains is I I took my NPC beat machine into the studio and I was working with really you know they were putting us with really big producers beat nuts uh, like some some guys from Denmark who were making huge songs with like Britney Spears and stuff and I in those studio sessions my beats were being liked by them over me liking theirs so I kind of had this feeling like you've got something from day one without having to say that I just kind of always knew. Um, and then living that experience and then creating another band after it and we built huge fan bases with that band and toured like that's really kind of what it's always been about is the actual going and playing great shows meeting fans and trying to inspire people or hearing their stories as well um, and it's always kind of built it's built like I, I look at my I get to see the you know the numbers of what's selling and where and I've seen like numbers are my numbers are big in Australia and the States, way more than they are in the UK. So there's this weird thing that's happening is that the story is traveling in a bizarre way that I could never have understood, you know? Um, and the music, every time a, a kid finds that there's 10 albums, like I would have loved to have discovered an artist and realized that there's 
10 albums to go and listen to. You know, the worst thing is when you're getting into an, art, an artist, he's got like five songs and you're like, oh, cool, you get to them. You make one album, it's great, way. And then second album's like, eh. And then, uh, whereas with me, you'll hear the worst album I ever made and it gets better and better and better. So I'm still, I don't look at my songs like they're amazing. I still think there's so much, so, so much place to go and scope to go. And uh, I'm building up to being able to record with an orchestra and be able to make soundtracks for games and films. So I love being an artist and I love just putting records out and, but I'm on a, a journey and it's more about yeah, building a trajectory. Yeah. And it's more about doing great things that feel good. Um, Cause I know that when we did Cellable Brains, we built 10,000 fans in a month. We did cause they were, they were saying you can't release a record unless you, we need this amount of fans built in the, in the tank. And we went out and did it in a month. So I know that the, the potential of doing it's always there. But I think you have to be strategic about when you pull the trigger. And for me, I've got all these records and we're building up to the TV series. Pull the trigger then and, and actually do proper marketing rather than at, at the moment, I just enjoy making the music. You know, like I've got um, by the end of this, pa this uh, year, I'll have three more records ready. So, you know, people are finding records that I made record machine i made three years ago <laughs> so i'm like just i'm finally getting you know all the records out so by the time a, a big number i actually find my music i might actually have something that i love <laughs> uh, like like really i'm super super happy with you know but so are, are, are you and billy still going to be performing working together or is he more settled down with what he's doing in life with his kids what yeah yeah i mean bill's got three kids and he's really into that you know just being a a, a a family guy and i don't think he makes much music anymore i think he does produce edm and little things like that but i don't think it's a big part of his world and i mean he did it for a while and i think it's uh he works you know a really good job now and um i think he's kind of moved you know away from like the creative war every day of coming up with new ideas and i'm completely in that space i love that space that is my life i feel, feel like uh I have to do that to maintain a mental health, <laughs> you know, like it's, I couldn't stop. Whereas I think Bill falls in that category of like, it was great at the time, but I'm happy. I have all the other things I want. I don't, I'm not in a state of discontent, you know, whereas me, my content is, is leading inside making great art, you know? So, um, so we're very different people in that way. And I think that was also a part of the wedge that pulled us a, a part of the, I just think now we're at peace with where the other is at, you know? But, but, but would, would we do a record together? Hell yeah. I mean, we'd always, I think there's always a chance of, you know, there's going to be soundtrack, rebuilding the soundtrack, doing old stuff and then remaking them or making the whole new records. I think there's always, you know, scope for that. I don't think we would ever close the door to doing any of that stuff. So not necessarily a tour, but uh, I mean, you guys could end up coming back. And maybe like you said, maybe, maybe this would be uh, San Jacinto. You guys all... <laughs> Well, we'll we'll probably, perfect close to the chapter. We'll probably headline the San Jacinto High School, uh, you know, prom. You know, we'll be the headline act that night. <laughs> and that would be, we've made it. We've made it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, we, 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 we probably could. I mean, it, it really just depends. We got, we got offers to do all the major fit festivals um, when the documentary came out. And it was just, Bill was working on some other stuff and it was, I was in this band, so it didn't really make sense at the time. But who knows, you know, the right time can always happen. I think with the TV show, when we actually get that out, I think uh, there might be a demand for it. But also, like next year, I'll be doing a lot of solo touring. So, you know, I'm just going to keep doing my thing and keep building it, you know. Is there a genre that's kind of out of bounds for you? I mean, you dabbled in punk, you got hip hop. I mean, could we see maybe you go of like that country influence, maybe getting EDM uh, from Billy or anything like that? Or is it <laughs> quickly, you're a hip hop artist, you're a punk artist. Yeah, I'm making an EDM record right now. And in that, I'm working a lot in reggae, uh, some folk stuff, um, just loads of different world music. I, I used to, way back in the day, the first stuff I ever did was sample world music you know so Mexican and you know Latino music I used to do that all the time and so I don't think there's any limits on what what genre you know I 
the, the main thing I try to do is, is in some ways is stay away from genre in a way like being too, you know, it's difficult with rap when you're making a rap record because the rap's going to hold you to, to the genre, you know, but I always try to put as much different flavors in, you know, as I can. So you let the lyrics take you where it goes and then the music comes thereafter. Yeah. I always kind of make like a, a mixtape of what the record is and, and it'll be full of just loads of different genres. And then I'll try to pull them into what I'm kind of trying to make. So I'm ma- massively influenced by like ska and kind of uh, reggae and that kind of swing. Um, and then I've, my favorite genre to listen to is, is folk singer songwriters. So I do like the, type, the country type stuff and, and I, I haven't figured out how to work that fully into like an EDM or hip hop track yet, but it's fun to try, you know, I probably will figure it out at some point. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I've heard any uh, kind of mixes of the EDM and ska music just yet. <laughs> I mean, yeah. maybe you try and get something like the toasters mixed with that. I don't know, Tiesto or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? I mean, Skr- I think Skrillex probably done it. You know, there's probably there's a couple, Wait. couple, couple of people that have tried it and done it, but yeah, I'd, I'd give it a go. Well, kind of, kind of wrapping things up, definitely enjoyed uh, talking with you. For, for those interested in learning more, like mentioned earlier, that the next chapter, obviously you got stuff going on in TV and film, working with EDM. I mean, let, let us know where, where are we going to find out more information about you and just anything you'd like to share. Well, I keep, I keep everything updated on the, um, uh, my Facebook page. So there's a forward slash brain in the cloud on Facebook, but there's also, if people want to reach out to Gavin Bain on Facebook, I always kind of chat to everyone there. Um, and then on YouTube, I update a video, put a rap video or, or freestyle or something up every other day on YouTube, uh, on the forward slash youtube.com forward slash brains in the cloud and on syllable and brains as well. So the syllable brains and brains one is just kind of getting all the music, just loading it up, you know? So, um, and then Instagram is just at Brains McLeod. Twitter is at Brains McLeod. Yeah. And that's B R E I N S M C L O U D. All right. Well, hey, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, look forward to uh, seeing where you guys go uh, down the road, uh, what you're doing yourself, and uh, seeing if uh, you're going to be able to parallel that uh, Bohemian Rhapsody movie. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thanks for thanks for chatting to me, and I hope uh, everything is all good out in South Florida. Um, and God, I'd like to get out there one day, but uh, who knows? Maybe next year, a, sta- a stateside tour is something that, even if it's just small, even if it is just proms, <laughs> even if, if it is just going across the universe, it's played at proms. Well, uh, well know that you know that you end up playing a role, so I mean, you'd probably be able to fit in as an American fairly easily. <laughs> Yeah, you just got to work on your tan if you're coming to Florida, you know. <laughs> There's hilarious stories of having to keep our tan updated and uh, always end up looking like uh, Ross from Friends. <laughs> 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 but no, thanks a lot for having me. It's been a pleasure, dude. Absolutely. Yeah, maybe we'll uh, hook up again down the road. Thanks a lot, buddy. Yeah. Take All care, right. man.